Okay. Alright. Observer, or greater than observer underscore, is a cyberhunk cyberhunk. <laughs> Right out the gate, a dummy stupid mistake is a cyberpunk psychological horror game from Polish developer Bluber Team, released for Windows, PS4, and Xbox One in 2017. Bluber being a developer with a difficult and arduous journey leading up to Observer. It came about after the fallout of fellow Polish developer Nibris, who, after building hype for a black and white psychological horror game called Sadness for the Nintendo Wii, quietly shut down and absorbed into the fantastically named Bluber where they created a handful of forgettable indie titles before releasing a game called Layers of Fear in 2016. Clearly adept at the horror genre, the crew was emboldened to quickly begin work on a more ambitious horror game. Observer was met quite positively by critics, who praised it for its world building and atmosphere with only a handful of dissenters and the usual fervent wailings of I'm gonna make the bizarre and misguided assumption that you may have followed my videos chronologically, and if so, you may have noticed that the last game I reviewed was another sci-fi horror game called Soma. Having now followed it up with Observer, I am noticing a continuing and disconcerting trend of indie horror games that I either completely miss or ignore out of genre apathy. I spend a lot of time being frightened by both the path the video game industry is on- Is that any- Where is it gonna go? Is he gonna be able to get it off? He's got it, Max! There it is! Got it! And by how much comfort I take in older media. And look, sometimes I'll see these games on Steam and think, sure, this sounds interesting, but one, this requires money, and two, I, I guess I guess that's it. Apart from both being first-person sci-fi horror games, Soma and Observer share a couple similar themes, and I was surprised to find myself on different sides of the same issue when each game presented them. It turns out, complex issues like transhumanism, artificial intelligence, virtual realities, and the impact of advanced technology on society can be examined from different perspectives. I don't like having my foundations rattled like this. I thought I felt one way, but now, I don't know, it's like when I was 18 and thought, in 10 years I'm gonna have my life figured out and I won't be desperately clinging to my boyhood dreams like a piece of driftwood in a sea of failure. Just row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. If you're not familiar with the concept of cyberpunk, cyberpunk is one of the better punk contracted subgenres, just above Diesel, Steam, and C. But I don't really, I don't have a good way of quickly summarizing what cyberpunk's all about, so if you want a little crash course, just consume all of this! Uh, I'm sure you can do it, I'm sure you're not gonna have a problem with it because, uh, you gotta not sleep, but, um, sleep, sleep's working against us, you don't, you don't need to do that, that's, that's something that, you know, not, not a lot of people talk about, is how, how we, we just don't need to sleep. Observer begins in Poland 2084. Krakow and its augmented citizens were recently afflicted by a digital plague called the Nanophage, leading to thousands of deaths and a great deal of conflict and crime in the city. Amidst all the chaos, a megacorp corporation called Chiron managed to take control of Poland and instill a Kafka-esque police state where people are sectioned off into different classes, with those in the lower class being made to live in stacks or filthy, dilapidated, barely functioning prison-like tenement buildings that the police don't even bother protecting due to how hopelessly riddled with crime they are. Helping to enact Chiron's rule are a police unit called Observers. Observers are given the tools and permission to hack into people's minds to interrogate and intimidate them. It is one of these feared observers that we take control of. A hard-boiled and grizzled observer named Daniel Lazarski is sleeping in his super fucking cool, like the coolest thing I've ever seen car, when a call from his dispatch wakes him up. She notices that he looks a little out of it and suggests he use his dream eater device to inject something called synchrazine. They don't go into it a whole lot, but it's clearly some kind of antipsychotic that observers need to take, presumably because of the strain that entering people's minds might put on your psyche. 
The call is interrupted by Daniel's estranged son, Adam. He has somehow hacked his way into Dan's car and is clearly paranoid and panicked, but the call fades before any more information is learned. Dan is able to trace the call to someone who is not Adam, in a stack in the Class C district. So he shows up to the apartment to find it ransacked and inhabited only by a headless corpse. Without a head, Daniel's not able to analyze the body's neural implant and learn its identity. Also, you know, without a head, it's hard to tell if, if that's your son, because you can't you can't look at his face. To make matters worse, a lockdown has been initiated in the area, meaning not only can Daniel not leave the property, he can't contact his dispatch. Without much in the way of options, he begins to investigate this murder and search for his son, provided that is not his son dead there. A lot of this investigation involves walking the halls of the apartment building, knocking on doors, and interacting with the tenants, who are all either paranoid, uncooperative, creepy, or insane. One aspect of it that I'm sure must have been born out of limitation, but I appreciate nonetheless, was the feeling of an absence of humanity. This game feels lonely, even though you are technically surrounded by the stack's tenants. The only person you really interact with face to half face is the building's janitor Janus. And even there, it's not an entirely fulfilling human interaction. Janus is mostly made from machinery as a result of extensive war injuries, injuries that have also clearly affected his personality and speech. He's helpful and well-intentioned, but you can tell the light is getting pretty dim upstairs. Which, by the way, the technology used for Janus's augmentations is, is kind of interesting. It seems very advanced, but just shy of what would be ideal, you know, when you're getting a lot of your body replaced in, in this, you know, very futuristic advanced world. It's conceptually impressive, but the end result is, is uh, it's a bit of a compromise. Any other conversations you will have will be conducted through a grainy CRT screen affixed to every door. And while these are certainly fun character sketches and further explore how fearful and broken humanity has become, they sure don't feel comforting. I wouldn't want to open any of these doors and see these people. I don't like seeing people. This building is the bottle where a good 95% of Observer will take place, and that's simultaneously a fault and a strength of this game's location. In the search for Adam and an elusive killer, we uncover a tattoo shop acting as a front for an illegal body modification racket. Some of the tenants are participants in a child sex trafficking ring. There's a little girl with an imaginary friend that turns out to have a much more sinister explanation. There is a surprising amount of story to explore, and initially I didn't feel like there was, but by pure happenstance I had failed to capture footage of the earlier moments in the game, and while purely intending to speed through the opening for coverage, I kept stumbling on rooms and whole plot lines that I didn't even notice my first time around. There is a near suffocating atmosphere of hopelessness in this world that I think makes this interpretation of cyberpunk ideas quite unique. Cyberpunk media usually has some kind of glimmer of hope, some sort of uprising that could, if not overthrow a malevolent force, then at least reveal its vulnerability. The world presented here is one teetering on the brink of dystopia. There isn't a plucky group of hackers and detectives that are going to take down Chiron and start rebuilding. Humanity is kind of set in its ways. You get the impression that even if Chiron were removed from the equation, the damage is already done. The people that remain just want to batten the hatches and trick themselves into thinking we haven't already lost. The sequences where Daniel is required to use his dream eater to enter people's minds also distinguishes Observer a great deal. It's actually sort of difficult to describe, but I suppose you're probably looking at footage of it right now, so I, I guess it's not that hard to understand. Going into someone's head puts you through the rapid-fire, impressionistic, and visually stunning, uh, David Lynch f**ks David Cronenberg psychedelic fever dreams that, to a near punishing degree, inundate you with digitized, metaphoric representations of memory and thought. Do you remember the night we met? It's hard to forget. I found a lot of these moments really amusing. Throughout this intense mangle of uncomfortable sound and imagery, I had a huge grin on my face because it was so well executed. Finally, something that reflects all the shit I see every time I close my fucking eyes. In between what may just be the chaos of synapses firing, there are little vignettes of a person's life that, while often not vital to the investigation, help flesh out their character and motivations. It's occasionally pretty effective at this. The first brain you jump into belongs to an 
ex-convict trying to get his life back together while battling an addiction to an illicit inhalant called feed that shows up frequently. You really get a sense of what's important to this guy and what he wants and what haunts him. There are little reoccurring motifs throughout his Dream Eater sequence like showers and barred doors. This guy probably had a real rough time reintegrating into Class C life. I enjoyed all of this a great deal, but I can certainly understand some critics' fatigue. They can go on for a while and begin to feel like a VFX showreel. The reality outside of these dreamscapes is in itself somewhat nightmarish and evocative of these things, and eventually Dan's own memories and the memories of those he jacks into begin to bleed together and make their way into waking life. We really start to feel his grasp on reality and time slipping. I have nothing but praise for two-thirds of this story, but I can't deny an abundant feeling of frustration that we are only given the most fleeting glimpse of how the world of Observer works in a general sense before we are put in a bottle and before we experience it go off the rails. How much of this do I accept as canon to the world and how much of it is just abstract hallucination? It's not hard to grasp most of the concepts we are taught, like observers, a great war that happened, a digital plague, people escaping into VR, the looming presence of this oppressive corporation, I can process that these things are happening. But on top of my selfish desire to see more beyond an apartment building, I think it's just my preference with storytelling that we see how Daniel functions on a procedural, regular basis before we are tasked with something as big or heavy as rescuing his son. I want to first understand what kind of person Daniel is, and determine determine whether or not I care about him or if I'm on his side, considering that this starts with Daniel waking up to the inciting incident. He wakes up to something that requires him to break protocol, and I found that a little jarring because I didn't get to quite see what the protocol was. It immediately decides to not give you time to understand Daniel and what he does, and instead makes his motivation a sort of obvious relatable one. Son is missing. Find son. Everybody loves their son. You'd want to find your son, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to? find him. Your son's waiting right here. God damn it. One of the more exciting developments in Dan's investigation is a sequence where he decides to use his dream eater on a dead body. Something that, as soon as it was suggested, I thought, I love this concept. This is great. In attempting to do so, Dan is warned that this removes a lot of the safeguards involved in using the device, and on top of that violates something called the Postmortem Observation Act of 2061. And while I love the detail that they would have legislature in place for invading the minds of the dead, I feel like this moment and this act could have been built up better. It was already hinted at that observers are prone to going berserk and are generally feared by the public, so it would have been easy to throw in a line about not doing something exactly like this, and not much is shown as consequence other than he seems a little more out of it when he comes back. At another point, Dan wakes up plugged into another dead person with no memory of plugging into him, and my excitement about this concept was substantially increased. The way they seem to be doubling down on Dan, just losing all sense of time and reality, was really fun for me. I love things that play with my perception and sort of try to outsmart me, which is not difficult to accomplish. I was fully ready to be confronted by some kind of long con. I was uh, displaying my cheek to the developer, completely ready to receive some kind of thought-provoking cerebral twist to slap me in the face and make me feel like a dummy, make me feel alive, fuck me up, Luber. And the fact that I didn't receive this slap and continue to feel like an untethered specter traversing a colorless, stifling wasteland, well, it really gets my goat. Looking for something that'll break through, you know, something tough. As Observer begins to come to a close, I realized how often the main story felt like a subplot, and the parts I found more interesting were being swept under the rug in favor of something that I didn't have time to form a connection with. I could feel the window of opportunity for something truly fun and unexpected starting to close as plot lines were discarded and new ideas were introduced to have something resembling a conclusion. New ideas, mind you, that deeply affect and muddle the game's themes. It quickly and unsuccessfully, I feel, changes course from what it was doing pretty successfully. It near perfectly evokes an amalgamation of its influences, simultaneously acting as a beautiful meditation of cyberpunk concepts, as well as working in some creative and original new elements to shake things up. It's just a shame that it mostly functions as a cyberpunk four rooms anthology a until it tries to bookend the story with the Find Your Son plotline that I had not cared about the entire time. Like, Dan, I'm sure you care about your son. Why else would you be here? But I don't know him. I barely know you. I barely understand how this world works. The real one that I'm living in.
As many have pointed out, despite being billed in the horror genre, Observer does not include many of the staple gameplay elements of horror titles. This confuses and upsets people because there is only one way to make a horror game, and you gotta shoot the monsters. It's certainly not a survival horror game. It controls as much more of an exploration-based adventure game, where you explore the apartment building and surrounding area, looking for clues to whatever Daniel feels like investigating at that moment. There are three vision modes you can use to aid you in investigating crime scenes, and occasionally in solving some puzzles. Taking advantage of Daniel's eye augmentations, you can switch from normal vision to electromagnetic vision and to bio vision, which highlight electronic and biological evidence respectively, and night vision, which looks cool but is for the most part useless. While not entirely necessary or original conceptually, these abilities are so well realized and just a complete pleasure to look at. The developer's attention to detail extends into these functions and they really go out of their way to make this feel like a functional, if slightly wonky and low-tech piece of equipment. Even down to the way your electromagnetic vision highlights erroneous things like microwaves or TV sets, deems them unimportant, and then ignores them. It instantly turns your vision into a scene from Hardware or Terminator or, or any 80s film with some kind of robot vision. It completely charmed me. There isn't a whole lot of challenge to these segments, but there are certainly things you might miss as I learned through my second playthrough. Looking at your Dream Eater displays your objectives and allows you to use Synchrozine, which seems more important to the story, but you will come across a lot of it, and there was never a concern that I would run out or that there would be consequences for running out. Much like Soma, your vision will start to become clouded by digital artifacting, but it is easy to reverse these effects. I, I'm not sure if this was originally intended to be more important to the gameplay, but as it stands, it seems like it was added for, I, I don't know, quirkiness or world building? Conversations play out with a simple but effective branching path where you can choose to be more confrontational or friendly. I feel like your objective menu could have been a little easier to understand. I don't quite know when I've completed an objective or not. I mean, I'm not usually one to suggest having a, a heads-up display be more present and invasive, but I ended up staying in certain areas probably a lot longer than was required, because I wasn't sure if I had exhausted all of the clues yet. Most of the puzzles you will encounter will appear in the Dream Eater sequences, and they are not traditional in any sense. You won't be collecting items or trying to solve crazy puzzle locks or anything like that. They are subtle and mostly make use of the game's constantly changing environments. One part leads you into a room with several exits, but entering each one will loop you back into the same room. To escape, you have to pay attention to the screen that turns on every time you enter. The screen displays a specific part of that room that is near whatever door you need to enter next, and it goes on like that until you've worked out the correct sequence. Another one has you leading around a floating TV like a balloon on a string. Plugging it into sockets on the walls will let you move forward into another room, but straying too far from it will cause your screen to become garbled and artifacting, and the TV will scream and cry like a child. It's deeply unpleasant and forced me into this uneasy paternal relationship with a floating TV, which was surely the intended subtext. Other than this, your time spent in someone's head will feel like you're just moving forward through a series of loosely connected scenes and ideas, and some of these certainly managed to evoke a feeling of unease in me. I had no idea what this game was going to throw at me, where a door would open, when something was going to explode into cacophonous noise. I've seen a fair amount of complaints about the volume of jump scares in this game, and their sound volume and I am usually quite susceptible to them, and not overly fond of them. Maybe it was that the majority of them didn't land on me, or they might not have been meant to be jump scares. There were moments, and maybe this was just me misreading them, that I felt they were doing something like a jump scare, but instead of startle you with something popping out at you unexpectedly, they let you control or activate something that just kind of makes you uncomfortable. In my head it felt like something detached from a jump scare, but I'm also probably just an emotionally colorblind weirdo. There was one textbook jump scare that just, no buts about it, it got me fucking hard. I mean, the jump scare was effective, it, it, and and you know what? It earned it. I, I wasn't even mad, I just, I just wagged my finger at the screen and said, <laughs> You got me, you fuck. It's when you find your way into Janus's office and you start rifling through his stuff, and just at the moment where I was halfway through the thought, that would be fucked up if he was right behind me right now. Son of a bitch! So the other thing about the gameplay, which no doubt led to Soma comparisons, is that there are a handful of cat and mouse challenges, where you will have to sneak around a patrolling spooky robot monster. 
while you accomplish some kind of goal or try to reach a new area, and the closer it gets to you, the more distorted and digitized your perception becomes. It's something I openly loathed about Soma, because I felt it was cut and pasted from Frictional's previous games out of obligation, or some sense of a standard to uphold. Either way, it interrupted a solid sci-fi adventure game with loud noises and goofy jump scares. Paired with Soma's pretty sophisticated narrative, it felt cheap and out of place. And it feels cheap and out of place in this one too, but I'll admit to being less bothered by it this time around. I think it might have something to do with their mechanics being easier to comprehend, or the purpose of the creatures having more weight behind it, and it coming off as much more of a tense puzzle than an annoying leftover from another game. There are far less moments where I was just sitting in a corner for five minutes waiting for it to wander off. This is in no way meant to imply that these parts are successful or that horror fans will enjoy them. All I mean is that, as someone who is actively frustrated by this concept, I was able to set aside my feelings for the brief moments I had to take part in them. Look, I spend most of my life in hiding. You think I want to emulate that experience while I'm actually hiding from reality? I don't like air! I really enjoyed most of my time playing Observer. It certainly could have been improved. I would have liked a slightly more traditional approach to some of the puzzles, where I have just a notch more agency and maybe an inventory. I feel like being able to collect items to use later helps me feel like I'm accomplishing something. Movement feels appropriately labored and sluggish given that our character model is in his mid-70s. There are some quirky interaction controls similar to Amnesia and Soma, and it feels relatively free roam, which was nice, but that's probably what allows you to spend so much time busying yourself with matters outside the main story, to the point that you lose a meaningful connection to it. The key here is world building. The incentive to explore is discovering more about the world, and that was worth it for me. I like stories. I like shooting also, and fighting things also, but this didn't have that. And that's okay. It's gonna be okay. I mean, not really because the video game industry has become a soulless, dead-eyed autoclave, stripping anything of value from a property and then forcing its corpse to dance like a limp marionette for sequel after sequel until idiots stop throwing coins at it. Fallout 76 is entirely online. But you know what? I'm trying to say you still have options. This game's very pretty is a looker. Every corner of Observer is a grimy, trashy tableau. I lost count of how many times I just stopped to absorb everything on the screen. Take a screenshot at any point during your playthrough and make it your desktop wallpaper. I guarantee you it will be beautiful. Well, fucking hold the camera still, you jerk. Untidy strips of wiring line hallways connected to a variety of weathered and beaten up devices and CRT screens of different makes. Everything about the technology itself looks like it's been repurposed and reconfigured a dozen times over with exposed circuitry and inelegant design. Google Electric Wires and India, and it, it looks like that, but slightly less terrifying. The perimeter of the building is an amazing rendering of cyberpunk scenery, complete with rain, flickering advertisement loops, neon lights, pigeons that proved to really fuck up my frame rate, and just a ton of probably meaningless but nonetheless gorgeous design decisions. Why is this Hans Belmer style mannequin torso floating in green liquid in a glass box affixed to a wall? I don't think we'll ever know, but do we need to? If ever there was a more literal interpretation of low-life high-tech, I have not encountered it. The deeper you go into the stacks, the more you see that technology stripped away and rooms replaced by holes knocked out of walls, leading to what may as well be closets stuffed with a mattress and months of trash piling up. It's all fantastically gross, scary, and not good. Not the type of place you want to end up in life. The extremity of these visuals is only increased when inside someone's head. Metal pipes will endlessly spew out garbage and rows of rumbling washing machines will line walls. The strips of wires will become a dense thicket akin to vines in a jungle. All of this is complemented by a number of disorienting and interesting visual effects, including one particularly effective one that mimics time-lapse photography. This is, without question, Observer's biggest strength, its willingness to assault you with a confusing, impressive, and beautiful string of images. Can this become a bit of a strain on your PC? Yes. Will you begin to see a drop in frame rate? Yes. But did this bother me? Yes. Not content with merely a near-perfect visual representation of a cyberpunk world, the developers managed to secure the vocal talents of Rutger Hauer, a man responsible for one of the most genre-defining moments in cyberpunk history. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> 
So not only did they make this world heavily inspired by Blade Runner, but they got one of the main dudes from Blade Runner as their main character. That's fucking sick, right? Well, I don't know. Everyone seems to be kind of split on this. It appears critics couldn't quite peg his performance. Does he sound lethargic and barely present because that's what the character called for? Was he making some kind of meta statement with his clear disinterest in the material? I get the impression that a lot of people are engaging in some intense mental gymnastics in order to avoid the looming possibility that maybe Rutger Hauer didn't live up to the hype created simply by his involvement. Jesus. But I really enjoyed his voice. I think his grizzled, aged, raggedy as shit voice is the foundation holding up a kind of flimsy character. Well, well, you must be Helen. What else are we hiding in here? Hearing him speak was one of my favorite parts of Observer. He just effortlessly sounds amazing, so I didn't mind the fact that he kind of loses track of what his character sounds like from moment to moment. Fucking great. Okay, Dan. Maybe it's not him. Doesn't have to be. At times I even thought, wow, what an odd choice of delivery on that line. I wonder what the thought process behind that was, but he carries so much honesty and realism in his voice, I just stopped questioning it. No rest for the wicked. How's the dream meter treating you? Well, I'm not a vegetable yet. Could have fooled me. Hardy hard. Guy knows what he's doing. He pared down a 300-word villain monologue to two sentences that will live eternally in film history. All the other voice work is great. There are a lot of fun performances from the collage of seedy characters that make up the tenants. Oh, and who's your friend? Friend? It's just me, ma'am. Oh, I have to go now. Alrighty. The music, composed by Arcadius Rykowski, is pretty good as well, especially during the David Fincher-esque opening credit sequence. It's a brief, minimal track with some creepy ambient noise accompanied by this harsh digital bass line. It's fantastic. It's filthy, it's dirty, and I love it. A lot of the soundtrack works as a fitting wallpaper with compressed rhythmic drumming and an interesting mix of digital and organic soundscapes. It sounds mechanical and dirty, but peppered with this almost Eastern spiritual theme running throughout. You can hear the Blade Runner and Ghost in the Shell influences pretty clearly. They are just dipped in a fresher layer of grime and reverb. There are a couple tracks that get tiresome if you're stuck in an area longer than five minutes, which will usually be one of the monster segments. And whenever monsters are around, the music becomes a little more jarring and bothersome. I could go the rest of my life without hearing this noise again. I'm already spooked, okay? You don't gotta overdo it. Who are you trying to impress? Guys, this is what this game does best. It just sits there looking and sounding beautiful. It's hard to criticize that. And, oh, wait a second, the sound design. Uh, in general, I've seen it get a lot of praise, but especially after playing Soma, I was not impressed by that. I know that's a thing a lot of people don't care about, but much like informing the world of the radio frequency identification chips that the government has been secretly implanting in us, this is important to me. To see the care that Frictional put into their sound design was amazing. It was so good that I just noticed it immediately, like, wow, all this sounds great. Observer sounds good as well. Attention citizens, curfew is now in effect in all Class C districts. It didn't detract from my enjoyment, it was just clearly lacking that extra bit of attention that probably went into the environments. Uh, not to completely contradict everything I just said, but there were a couple moments uh, where there was this nice mix of binaural audio and the sort of limiting of your depth of field that they would do, especially during moments where it's implied that something is following you. That was really effective. It's, it's even in a game where I'm pretty sure nothing's gonna come after me. They do a good job of instilling this doubt that actually something might come after me. It was not a consistent thing throughout the game. It only popped up once or twice. But when it did, I was like, all right, f you, but, but also you've earned my respect. Does anybody care about that? 
Holy shit, I, I'm sorry about that. I'm, j I'm picky about the way things sound. That's why it's unbearable to hear my own voice. So, uh, Observer is, uh, I really enjoyed my experience with Observer. It's one of few games that I'd intentionally stop playing just to reflect on it for a couple hours. Its main plot uh, leaves a lot to be desired, but in between there are some great diversions from that. I would have preferred it be a more intimate character study of Daniel, but what it winds up being is an intimate character study of its setting, which to be fair is pretty dang interesting, but it's the only thing keeping me from declaring this game a complete success. I didn't really feel connected to the search for Adam. If anything, I felt more for two of the characters that we meet early on, who are sort of innocents that get wrapped up in Adam's story. We get to go in their heads and get a really close look at who they were and what they experienced while knowing that they're dead. There is some power there and potential for power with that storytelling device, but I don't feel like they did much with it besides take you on a visually stunning VFX reel. Its gameplay is minimal and a little inconsistent, there will be long stretches of just knocking on doors or collecting clues, and then every once in a while they will throw you a puzzle or a hide from the monster sequence. It's not ideal, but it feels good exploring and finding new bits of lore. Every moment looks gorgeous and unique, but it might come at the price of stuttering frame rates, even if you have a PC more than qualified to run it. I've read that this problem persists on consoles as well. I think it's also been weirdly polarizing, but maybe that's just how things work lately. Positive criticism for it often omits the game's abundant flaws and negative reviews nitpick about genre and lack of scares, often inarticulately. I mean, to be honest, this game is a walking simulator which makes me sick. The illumination feels the game developers just chuck every filter in a Unity plugin into the game. It is a harsh game. Look, you gotta have a definition in your head of what a walking simulator is. It's obviously something Something you don't like, and the developers didn't do anything to mask what this game was. I feel like you should have been able to see, hey, that's the thing I don't like, I should probably avoid that. You don't like it, baby. You don't have to watch. This game is too weird and random. Give it a miss and get a proper horror game. I mean, I'll, I'll give you that. Fear is a very subjective thing, though. There isn't really a universal thing people are afraid of. Well, maybe death, but that's what spirituality is for. 80-year-old guy walking around empty house. Nothing more. Well, first of all, he's 70, so how fucking dare you? But that's, of course, untrue. I can see where you got that if you gave up early into- Oh, I've read two different reviews and haven't found anything about fighting or shooting anything. Usually in a horror game, there's at mostly some action and others just a little, but are you just walking around looking through memories or whatever through the entire game? Buddy, I played the whole game and I still haven't found out anything about fighting or shooting. Like, if you find out something I don't know, get back to me because we gotta figure this out. I'd recommend it if you're a fan of the genre. I can see fans of mainstream horror and survival horror games not really getting much out of it. It's more of a creepy, unnerving mood piece than something that will genuinely frighten or startle you. Plus the gameplay is much more akin to an exploration-based adventure game. So if you already don't like those, you know, Soma, Firewatch, Gone Home, etc., Observer probably won't change your mind. Very interesting. <laughs> What the fuck? How long have I been on the phone? You have always been here. You uh, have always uh, been here. Hey, greetings are awkward. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for watching this video. This is the end of the video. You should be proud for making it this far. I wouldn't have made it this far. You're crazy. You guys are crazy. Thanks for watching. I just wanted to point out that I, uh, a couple days ago, I made it to 5,000 subscribers, which is crazy. It's super, it's very surreal. It's very surreal. Uh, it's very crazy. How crazy? Real crazy. Uh, on a scale from one to 10, it is real crazy. So thank you so much to all of you who have subscribed and special thank you, extra thank you, even more favoritable thank you to those, I'm sorry that was a little bit too much. <laughs> Thank you so much the, for, for anything, for any acknowledgement of my existence, but thank you especially if you donate on Patreon because that really helps me out. Uh, no joke. It's not even funny. It's not, it's not humorous at all. Please don't laugh at it. 
but yeah thanks so much for watching um i i'm i'm gonna work hard to to do more to increase the value the quality of this content you are receiving and uh yeah as of as of yet i have yeah i have not given up <laughs> update i will continue to make things because i have not lost hope in myself it's good it's good uh thank you for that thank you for giving me that um how are you guys doing are you guys doing all right i, th I think i should also make sure you guys are, are prepared for uh, nibiru is a planet that's in a that's a, a technically uh, orbits around uh, earth and uh it's it's going to destroy our planet once it circles back around we narrowly avoided a disaster in uh like 2003 2012 2017 uh, but you know what? It, it, could, could, it could be any day. It could be any day. The science is not exact, but we should always be prepared for the impending uh, destruction of our planet. But of course, those of us who are aware of it will have vacated uh, the, the husk that humanity has left behind here. Anyway, thanks again. And bye.